Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Ellie Chen, and I'm here with my colleague Chao Wang. Chao, do you want to say hi? Chao and I both work on the Alexa team at Amazon, and today we're here to talk to you about acoustic event detection. Most likely, everyone here knows that Alexa, like other voice assistants, uses machine learning to enable automatic speech recognition so that we can understand and respond to customers. Today, Chow and I are here to tell you that artificial intelligence can go beyond just speech to understand the many other sounds that occur in the world around us. So think about the universe of sounds. A baby crying, the sound of a train going by, or the sound of a gunshot or a car accident happening. As soon as you hear any of these sounds, your brain can immediately identify what that sound is, and you also have an idea of what has occurred to cause it. Sound is second only to vision as a means by which us humans sense and understand the environment around us. Well, we know if humans can identify these audio signals that we should be able to train computers to do the same. Automatic sound event detection also known as acoustic event detection, uh, and sometimes you'll just hear me say AED, is an emerging field which focuses on the ability for computers to process audio and identify specific sounds. Why does this matter? Well, there are tons of cool things that AED enables. In the next following minutes, I want to take you through some of the cool new use cases that have emerged from recent research. In the field of conservation, Monitoring of endangered animals is an extremely important task. It's also an extremely difficult task that's also expensive and can be invasive. For example, trapping and handling animals, tagging them, or visual surveys such as counting their droppings is what's currently in use today. I, for one, would not want that job. Wolves are especially difficult to track because of their high mobility, their nocturnal nature, and their inherent shyness towards humans. However, Research done by the World Wildlife Fund and the University of Zurich in 2016 has shown that acoustic event detection can provide an alternate approach. Wolves communicate acoustically through howling. A wolf howl is a low frequency vocalization that can be transmitted over long distances. And the research has shown that passive sound recorders can detect these wolf howls and identify them from as far as three kilometers away. Similarly, a collaboration in 2017 of several institutions, including the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue University, showed that acoustic event detection can be applied to analyze field recordings and automatically identify up to 11 different species of birds. If you think about it, animals use sounds for lots of things, communication, echolocation, sexual display, and ter territorial defense. And so the ability to automatically identify these animals not just means you can identify, sorry, identify these sounds, means you can not just identify these animals, but you can also infer things like their abundance or scarcity, their geographical distribution, and even infer their physiological state and behavior. This form of acoustic event detection is known as bioacoustic monitoring, and it is growing in popularity amongst ecologists as a non-invasive and scalable way to help establish sustainable management plans for endangered and at-risk species. Acoustic event detection is also used prominently in a new field called ambient-assisted living. This field uses technology and artificial intelligence to improve the quality of life for people who might otherwise not be able to live independently, such as people who are in recovery or commonly the elderly population. The Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium published a study that showed using a mix of audio and ultrasound retrievers, they were able to identify and observe the clinically relevant daily activities, such as cooking or cleaning, eating, sleeping, activities around personal hygiene, or simply walking around from elderly population in a domestic environment. Similarly, the Kaohsiung Medical University proved that they could achieve an over 90% recognition rate for sounds such as footsteps, a person falling down, or crying for help in a simulated test of over 100 different scenarios. A few years ago, 22 different countries in the European Union joined together to create something called the Ambient Assisted Living Program, which invests over 700 million euros each year into this field. And ABI research 
uh, estimates that the field of ambient assisted living will grow to over $35 billion by 2024. So this is a field to watch out for indeed. Switching gears, no pun intended, the innovation of self-driving cars is all the rage the last couple of years, and you've probably heard or seen many references to it during this conference. However, have you thought about the whole spectrum of technology that is needed to make sure that self-driving cars is safe? Think about it. You, as a human driver, are probably listening to the sound of cars around you as you drive without being fully conscious of it. Hopefully, you're also listening to the sound of horns honking, sirens going by, tires squealing, or even the sound of a motorcycle engine revving as it's zooming by you. One of the biggest limitations of the first generation of autonomous vehicles is that despite all their lasers and radars and fancy cameras, which are super cool, without any acoustic detection capabilities, these vehicles are basically deaf, which is a pretty significant handicap compared to the average human driver. A 2016 study sponsored by the Research and Technology Center at Bosch showed that it is possible to detect these sounds which are critical to driving safely, such as sirens, railroad crossing bells, screeching tires, and horn honking. More recently, a study done by the Robotics Institute at the University of Oxford in 2018 demonstrated that it's possible not just to identify and classify these sirens and horns, but also to localize them and determine what direction these sounds are emanating from, which is super important for driving safely. Uh, Aisha Evans this morning gave a great talk during the keynote about self-driving cars. And as you hopefully can see, they're coming, whether you're ready for it or not. And I, for one, would feel much better if the self-driving car I was in had acoustic event detection so it could hear and not just see. So I've just given you three wildly different examples about how this cool technology is being applied. But there are certainly hundreds more out there and thousands more that have yet to be dreamed up. The range of applications on this ability to detect and identify sounds is extremely broad, and we've only just started to scratch the surface. So now that I've shown you what AED can do, I want to just quickly cover uh, how does it work. The field of acoustic event detection encompasses a couple of different technologies, but overall the idea is pretty simple, especially if you're already familiar with automated speech recognition. So you start with some raw audio, you convert it into a feature representation, and then you run machine learning algorithms against that to get a desired output. With classification, which is in the top half, given the audio, you decide whether an event or any number of events has occurred. With, de with detection, given audio, you decide not just whether that event has occurred, but also when. So you want to be able to identify the start and end times of that event. You can also combine multiple technologies to do something slightly more sophisticated. For instance, if you hear the sound of people waiting around, the sound of luggage being dragged, and the sound of trains pulling in and out, you might be able to infer that you're at a train station. Alternatively, if you hear people talking to each other, phones ringing, the copier machine running, and also the sound of keyboards being typed on, well then you can probably infer you're in an office. And that technology is called audio scene analysis. So bringing it back to us here today, as you probably know, at Amazon, we are constantly thinking of ways for new, um, for new ways to delight our customer. Since we already do speech recognition, we know that Echo devices have microphones to pick up audio and the computing power to run machine learning algorithms on device. So our team thought, how can we leverage acoustic event, detec event detection technology to bring new value to Echo customers? And here's what we came up with. Guard is a new Alexa feature that helps you keep your home and family safe. When you leave, set Guard to away mode by saying, Alexa, I'm leaving. Once in away mode, your Echo device can detect the sounds of smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, and glass breaking. If one of these sounds is detected, Alexa can let you know with a smart alert via a phone notification. You can listen to a 10 second audio clip of the detected sound in the Alexa app, or drop in on your Echo remotely to investigate what's happening in your home. 
Guard works with security systems from Ring and ADT. Alexa can arm your system when you set Guard to away mode. And with professional monitoring, you can forward smart alerts to your security service provider. If you have connected smart lights, Alexa can control them when Guard is in away mode to make it look like someone's home. To set up Guard, open the latest version of the Alexa app on your mobile device, go to Settings, and select Guard. From there, follow the simple step-by-step -step instructions. Next time you head out, tell Alexa you're leaving to put her on guard. So as you heard, Alexa Guard is a feature that helps customers keep their homes safe. When you leave your house, Alexa will send you smart alerts via notifications on your phone if an echo device detects the sound of smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, or the sound of glass breaking. As you've probably inferred, we're using acoustic event det detection to detect these sounds on behalf of our customers. Now, I want to hand it over to Chow, who will take you deeper into the science behind how we brought Alexa Guard to life. Thank you, Ali. All right. Um, So let's go through the Alexa Guard implementation step by step. Um, uh, I will first introduce the system architecture and the uh, models that we built to detect glass breaking, smoke alarm, and seal alarm sound. And then I'll tell you how we collected the data and used the data to train and evaluate our solutions. I'll also show you some of the performance metrics that we monitored, starting from when we launched the, uh, the uh, solution initially developed using only in-lab data to the performance when it exited our beta program. Um, and then Ali will come back up here to talk about some design considerations to achieve good customer experience and ensuring their, uh, without compromising their uh, privacy. To better understand the design choices we made, let me first uh, walk you through the challenges that we have to, uh, we face in order to build a product like Alexa Guard. First, we run the sound detectors on device. By running the detection on device, we can process the audio locally and then discard the audio when nothing is detected. And, uh, However, running detection on device comes with the limitation of being constrained by the computation available on the device. So the detection models has to be very efficient, both in terms of the memory consumption as well as the computation. Um, this significantly limits the types of models we can explore because models that has lots of parameters naturally would require um, lots of computation power and storage. So this limits our ability to find the optimal solution. It has to fit the computation on device. Second, we want the detection technology to scale for future use cases. Today, for Alexa Guard, we only need to detect these sounds like glass breaking, smoke alarm, and CO alarms. But we don't want to just stop here, right? In the future, there could be other sounds that our customers tell us that we want you to be able to offer these features for us, and we have to be able to add these sound profiles into the detector without significantly increase the computation requirements of the devices, as well as not degrading performance that we already achieved on the existing features that we already support. Third, the target sound events can actually have very different characteristics. Just to take the example of glass breaking and smoke alarm, for example, um, glass breaking lasts only a few seconds. Um, if you hear the movies, like you hear them scattering and stuff, lasting for a long time, that's actually just the sound effect. If you hear the real glass breaking in real life, it really is just like two seconds, three seconds. But for smoke alarm, it can last up to several minutes or sometimes even longer. 
So how do you de design an algorithm, a detector, that can work for both these cases? Lastly, the detector must achieve very high accuracy. Um, because for a feature like a lexagard, it's essential that the detector do not miss these rare but pretty critical events like smoke alarms going off or um, glass breaking. But you cannot um, always alert the user because you detected spurious sounds that just sound similar to them. Um, and th this is especially challenging also because the sound we want to detect is actually really, really rare. Right? How many people actually will experience a glass breaking event? I hope that I will never ever have that happening to my house. So when you build a detector that tries to achieve a very high detection rate for these real events happening, you also cannot have you know, sort of a high false alarm rate of hypothesizing something that's not those target events as the target events. So given this significantly unbalanced data, because you know, this, when, this, when the detector is running, it's processing audio, and the audio, majority of the audio you, you process, do not contain the events. And even if you have a very, very low false alarm rate, it's going to generate more false alarms in relative to the kind of true events you might detect. So how do we address these challenges? A key design to our solution is the hybrid system architecture, where we use detectors running on the device in conjunction with detectors running on the cloud to jointly optimize the performance. So when a target sound is detected on the device, the audio clip corresponding to that detection is sent to a verification service on the cloud. This is very similar to how our wakeward technology works, with the difference that wakeward technology is trying to detect the Alexa keyword. So we use larger and more powerful models in the cloud to achieve um, high accuracy, because it can have a better ability to distinguish whether the target sound, whether the audio clip contains the target sound or merely something similar. So, if the cloud detector verifies that it's the target sound, then a notification is sent to the user's Alexa app to let them know that the system have detected something that sounded like glass breaking or smoke alarm. We also surface the audio clip corresponding to that detection to the user at the same time. So if you're away you know, on vacation or at work, you can basically click on the audio clip and listen to it to judge for yourself whether it's something alarming or just, you know, maybe the system made a mistake. Um, so the user can also look at their, um, the audio clips that we have in their history panel and they can basically listen to it anytime and delete one or all um, whenever they want to. So now let's dive deeper. Uh, sorry, let's dive deeper into the on-device detector. Um, so the detection starts with audio. We apply signal processing to the input audio stream to derive a spectral representation. In this case, it's a log filter bank energy or LFBE coefficients. Each spectral slice is computed from 20, 25 milliseconds of audio signal with a 10 millisecond step to look at the, uh, to convert the signal into a sequence of vectors. This step converts from a very high dimensional representation of the raw input because for a signal that's captured with 16K kilohertz, for example, 25 milliseconds is a 400 dimension uh, signal. But after the LFBE, it's going to be a 20 dimension uh, representation. And the spectral representation is a proven way of representing these kind of signals because you know, for many of the speech recognition applications, this is how people use to represent the signal. So then we converted the audio into the sequence of spectral uh, LFBE coefficients, right? The next step 
is we feed this sequence of ALF B vectors into a recurrent neural network so that it can derive a high level representation of the input sequence. You can sort of view that last um, output state of the um, recurrent neural network as an embedding that captures the optimal representation of this entire sequence of information. We use the long short term memory uh, LSTM, which is well known, well suited to perform these kind of classification tasks based on time series data. So once you have that embedding, you can add on top of it the classification layer. Um, in this case, we use just the simple fully connected uh, feed forward layer uh, with a sigmoidal uh, output to convert into a zero to one probability for a target event. You can have multiple of such output targets uh, based on that embedding. And each one of them is going to be predicting, uh, trained to predict one of those events. This is called a multitask um, learning framework. So notice that you know, I highlighted here, we have multiple output classifiers on top of this embedding. Each of them is for one of the sound class. And then when you train this neural network, you're not only optimizing the parameters to achieve the best prediction output accuracy, but also optimizing the layers that is gen the, the layers that's generating the embedding jointly for both of these prediction tasks. You can see that this network architecture scales very well when we need to increase the number of events we need to detect. Since the representation layer are shared across all these events, if you want to add a new type of event, you just need to add a new output layer on top of the, above the embedding layer so that you only have very small incremental um, addition in terms of model parameters. And um, it's, it, it can, um, it can um, you know, add additional events um, very efficiently. So this multi-learning framework also allows simultaneous detection of multiple events at the same time, because each one of them is independently trying to decide whether um, an event happens. So if multiple events happen at the same time, let's say smoke alarm and glass breaking happen at the same time, you just have both of these predictors to say one for that event. So we just went through the neural network architecture for the on-device detector. Um, it's very compact and it scales very well when you want to support additional sound types. Essentially, to add one more target, you just add another output layer. However, it's actually very difficult to achieve very high accuracy, I mean very high accuracy, on all the target sounds with such a simple model. And there's limited option for us to try optimize it um, for the application. So what do we do? We added a cloud verification component to further improve the accuracy. When the device detects an event, two possible outcomes, right? One is the device detector was right, this is a true event, or the device detector was wrong, it was not a true event, it's just something sounding similar. So the cloud verification is just another detector that can process these outputs and then try to decide um, whether it's the target event or not. So it's very similar in, in what it's trying to do. But the goal of the second detector is that it should accept the correct um, output from the device detector and reject the wrong output from the device detector as a false alarms. So if you look at the cloud detector, it has two advantages to achieve that. One is because it's sitting on the cloud, we can use much, much larger models, more sophisticated models to, uh, to do the detection. Usually more sophisticated models can do a better job at achieving high accuracy. In this case, we can use convolutional networks combined with LSTMs to try to achieve higher accuracy. The second is that the cloud model only needs to optimize for one target. 
because at that point, if I say, oh, I detect a glass breaking, I will try to build this model to see if it's a true glass breaking sound or not. So you can basically weigh that, do not have to compromise the performance across many different detection outputs. You can focus on that one task. So having cloud verification system was very helpful at reducing the false alarm rates. Um, but earlier I mentioned that sound can have different time scales. And uh, you know, in this case, we try to process the audio to detect whether it has glass breaking or smoke alarm. We actually can utilize the different time scale of these two signals to our advantage um, in this case. If you think about sort of things in your homes, these, we're, we're getting a, some uh, false alarms on smoke alarms from unexpected places, like security panels, because for some reason, they're designed to give you, um, sort of inform you about their state changes through these beeps that sound very similar to smoke alarms if you only listen to a short snippet. It's just beep, beep, beep. And uh, I hope that in the future, these companies, our partners, will design their security panel a little bit more friendly to our detector. But before they do that, we have to figure out a way to improve the performance. So one way is to add this mechanism, what we call temporary aggregation. So when you detect, um, when you run detection for, uh, when the smoke alarm happened, right, it go, it's going to run for a while. And if you listen, if you're detecting based on a short audio input, chances are you're going to detect multiple instances um, over you know, that duration. So we just added a very simple mechanism which is if you listen to, if you look at the detection results over, let's say, half a minute window, if you have multiple detections, then you send a notification to the user. But if you only got one detection in that window, chances are it's coming from some spurious sources that's producing these kind of confusing beepings, um, but it's not from a real smoke alarm. So, Let's switch gears to talk about data. In order to achieve high accuracy, it's really important to have data, and actually lots of data, to train the machine learning algorithm. So to teach the detector to recognize glass breaking or smoke alarm sounds, you'll need samples of those sounds to train the detector. How do you get sample audio of glass breaking? Well, you actually do need to smash a lot of glasses and record how do they sound. To create authentic sound profiles, we actually hired professional contractors and rented you know, these big warehouse kind of spaces and set them off to break a lot of glasses. Um, we actually broke hundreds of different windows, single pane, double pane, tempered or not, um, and they also have to break them with different kind of tools, um, crowbars, baseball bats, bricks. Um, you know, it sounded like a fun job, right? <laughs> so I actually keep on getting colleagues wanting to volunteer to help us collect data. Unfortunately, we have to say no to all of them because we have to leave this to professionals. Um, but we did our own data collection for smoke alarms and uh, CO alarm because you can buy these devices. You know, you can do the research, find top selling devices and get them and then, you know, set them off in the lab and then record them. And you can record them from different, di different distances or different background noise if you want to be thorough. Um, but actually, one thing we realized is that it's not easy to trigger these devices for real. Think about it, right? You want to collect authentic data as you want to have smoke alarms or CO alarms going off for real, not just press the test button. So we figured out how to trick a lot of them, but CO alarm is really, really hard. You don't want to gas the house in order to get them to trigger. So that's still, um, you know, we do our best. So if you have tricks that you know, let us know. So in addition to the positive audio samples to train the machine learning algorithm about what it sounds like for these target events, you also need example audio to tell the algorithm what are not the target events. 
right? And if these kind of uh, uh, detectors are deployed in a household environment, you do want to know what are some of the typical background noises that could maybe, uh, you know, that's going to be processed by the detector and that could mistrigger the, uh, the sound events. So this is a very open-ended data collection task. Um, so what we did is we, well, of course, you know, friends and family first, right? So we recruited a small um, group of volunteers. Volunteers are employees, team members, and we asked them to record, you know, background noises in their houses. And uh, they don't have to be in the house when they record. They can just record when they're not there because we're not interested in when the human is there. We're actually interested in when the house is empty, what are some of the environmental sounds that's going to happen. Um, so once we developed our initial version of the detector on these kind of device, uh, on these kind of data, you know, we go into, you know, we ask these friends and family and employees again to take these detectors home and then basically allow the detectors to learn from the mistakes that it, um, that it, it, it makes during that time. So, of course, I was one of those trial users and uh, it was actually kind of surprising but also depressing. The first time when we have those detectors running, I was typing in my office and it says glass breaking heard. I unwrapped a sandwich during lunch. It says I detected glass breaking. Because, you know, when we initially collect these data, you don't have these examples. And uh, as a result, compared to, say, the negative samples, which are probably largely silence, that a sandwich unwrapping and uh, keyboard typing probably sounds more like glass breaking than not. So we learned from these mistakes and we get these kind of examples and we teach the detector these are not, you know, the target events and gradually it improves. So collecting data is an expensive and time-consuming exercise. Um, as the keynote speaker Andrew Ng mentioned this morning, how do we reduce dependency on the data? So one of the uh, methodology he mentioned is data augmentation. Um, so we actually exactly did that. So there are several ways you can augment audio data. Um, in this case, you can mix sort of two audio clips together. One is the positive example, one is the negative example, and you mix them together for our task. It becomes another example of a positive um, target event, right? But at this time, it probably contained um, different background noises. So it, to the machine learning algorithm, it's a brand new training uh, example. Um, my favorite way is to actually mine data from soundtracks of video and movie data. So let me try to walk you through how this process might work. I think um, Professor Andrew mentioned quickly that you can do active learning um, to sort of try to select data for annotation. This is actually very similar to that. So you start with a detector um, that can detect your target event. Then you run them on these soundtracks uh, or clips of these, from these soundtracks to see, to get a detection score. And then once you get a score of how likely that sound clip contained glass breaking or um, smoke alarm, um, you rank them. And then you pick the top scoring ones. And those are more likely, for example, to contain the target event. Um, then you verify them to see if they do contain or not contain the target event. And then, you know, I mean, sometimes you say, okay, I want to find the target events. But sometimes I'm arguing that even the negative samples could be helpful because they teach you the boundary of what's the target event and what's not. And the reason that you get them into high score is because your system is is getting confused of those, right? Is getting confused about that particular decision boundary. So you can use them also for training the next iteration of the detector to make them better. Oh, sorry. I should have warned you, so I just want to play some clips for fun. So these are some of the positive samples that we found from these movie clips. All right, 
So now I want to walk you through how do we measure the performance of these kind of systems and show you some of the metrics we tracked from the beta studies. So acoustic event detection is an example of a detection problem. It's actually very similar to this classical problem, the radar problem. I mean, this is how I learned about detection when I was in university. Um, so for, if you remember, or if you're in that field for radar to detect animal um, airplanes, um, you have this metric called detection error trade-off curve, or DET curve for short. So there are two types of events that you can, uh, two types of errors that you can make. One is a false reject error, which is there's a true event happening, but you say you fail to detect it. So you reject it as false. Um, and in this case, you're missing the event, which is not good. But the other kind of error is called false accept. So this is the case where there's no true event, but you said, oh, there's, an, you know, there's a glass breaking happening. So this is also known as false alarm. And false alarms can be very annoying to the user, especially if you make a lot of them, right? Um, so between these errors, um, so why do we have a curve instead of just a point? So this is because when you build a detector, you actually can tune how it makes, like what kind of errors it makes by changing the detection threshold. So your detector is a binary classifier from, you know, it outputs a score from zero to one. If you set the threshold to be really high, then naturally you're going to have very few false, false, sorry, let me think. Um, if you set the threshold to be very high, then you'll have very few false accept errors, but you'll have potentially false, high false rejection errors. And Conversely, if you set the threshold to be low, then you have a lot of false accepts, but maybe no false rejects. Um, so by varying that threshold, you can get a curve. And, uh, and once you have the curve, you can actually compare two systems um, very clearly. Because if you only have two points on these two curves, then it's hard to say which one is better because you know maybe one is better in one Per, in one metric, but, but worse in another, right? So by having these uh, DET curves, we can clearly see that, for example, in this case, model one is worse than model two. Why do I say that? Because if you have the same false reject rate, then you'll have false, lower false accept um, with model two. Or if you cut a horizontal line, you'll see um, when they have the same false accept rate, then the false reject rate is lower for uh, the model two. So, but when you actually deploy this to a real system, you still have to pick a point on this curve, right? So we typically, for Alexa guard, we set the FRR to be like a hard metric that we have to meet. Like it cannot be higher than a certain number. And then with that assumption, we'll try to minimize the false alarm rates or false accept rates. And, uh, and I'm going to show you um, the performance curve when we, uh, when we run our study with a group of trial users uh, that are friends and family. <laughs> so this figure shows the false accept rates over time, over actually the course of a three month period, starting when we first deploy the models that we trained from using just what I call lab data, right? It's collected from the labs. And uh, we deploy this to trial users. And uh, so week one is basically the performance on the data that we got from that first week. Um, so this is the false alarm rate. So if you look at the, hor look at the curve um, horizontally, like every week, the data is actually different, right? Because, you know, user will be different, usage will be different for each of the week. So it's not a rigorous comparison on the same data set across time, but it's on sort of the, the same type of user using this, and then you're tracking that performance. Um, so it represents sort of what's the field, um, what we can expect from the, uh, the field uh, data. And uh, you can see that in general, 
the uh, trend is going down. That is because we keep on iterating, training the models and redeploying them. And uh, every time we retrain the models and deploy them, they do better. And if I highlighted a few of these points here, so this corresponds to a model improvement, this corresponds to another model improvement. And here is when we deployed the temporal aggregation technology. And it significantly reduced the false alarm rate for, for smoke alarm to the extent that it's almost zero. So now my colleague, Ali, is going to come back to stage and tell you about customer experience and privacy. Thank you, Chow. So Chow just told you that it was really important for us to deploy the most accurate, efficient, and scalable technology. But at Amazon, we work backwards. And so for us, the most important thing was to launch a feature that protected customer privacy and provided the best customer experience. So for us, it was important that Alexa Guard was a free feature, and it was also completely an opt-in feature. So Echo device customers, by default, have to go through a setup process and opt-in in order to use the feature. Oops. Not only do they have to opt into the feature, but they also have the choice to individually toggle which sounds Alexa can detect. Alexa goes on guard when customers tell us they're leaving the home, and she stops guarding as soon as they let us know they're back. As it is with speech recognition, we always animate the light ring whenever we're sending audio into the cloud. As Chow mentioned, customers have a history view so they can see and hear what Alexa detected. And finally, they can always delete their entire smart alert history at any time. And so this was important to us to provide the privacy and experience that we knew customers wanted. So what's the current status of Alexa Guard? Well, we released Alexa Guard to all Echo customers a couple weeks ago on May 14th, and we've been very happy with the adoption and reception from our customers. We did receive uh, a lot of great press, and we're humbled to see that come through from a variety of general and technology media outlets, as you can see. The overall theme was summed up really nicely, with Fortune magazine saying, Alexa can provide more peace of mind while you're away. Of course, my favorite quote isn't from the press, but instead from a customer who posted on Reddit and said this along with the screenshot of the notifications they received on their phone. I was at a family event when someone broke into my house this morning. Thanks to Amazon Alexa and some smart cameras, the suspects are now in custody by the local police. So now that you've heard Chow and I talk to you today about how Alexa has applied acoustic event detection, we hope to leave you today with this question. How would you use this technology? We hope that you've been just a little bit inspired to think about the creative ways that you could use acoustic event detection to improve the lives of your customers. Thank you.